Ever wondered what makes a racing carburetor different from a regular carburetor that comes out of the box? These guys like Bill Pink here make carburetors that are very, very specific, and we're gonna find out what that actually means. And yes, Bill Pink is Ed Pink's son. Fuel injection tells the engine how much fuel you're gonna give it. Yeah, and it tells everything. Well, I'm sorry, you're doing a steal. You're good, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> He's about to go off. <laughs> yeah. Fuel injection tells the engine how much fuel it's gonna get. With a carburetor, it's listening to what the engine's asking for and then giving it. How does it know what it's asking for? It's all about the signal. When that intake valve is open, the piston's moving down and it's creating that manifold vacuum. That manifold vacuum is, up, is reaching up to here and it's pulling that air past this. When the air comes past this, it's gonna create that signal back to the metering block, back to the, to the float bowl to pull that fuel in. It's listening to what's going on, which is why all these different devices are so important because there's like different listening apparatuses and then the fuel delivery that goes with it. That is very interesting. I'd say that's a pretty good explanation of what we're looking for because I don't think the average guy really understands what's going on. Like you get the people that are like, oh, it's just like a toilet bowl dumping fuel into the engine. It's like it's not. So much more. <laughs> you know, we could spend hours on this just on meter and blocks and base plates breaking up the different circuitry of the carburetor from the idle circuit transition, intermediate circuit, the main jet, how it all works and correlates together. This is a carburetor that's widely used and out here on the dirt cars or asphalt cars. It's the closest thing to a street carburetor. Like we talked about, the carburetors only know what's underneath them. Yes. They supply what air fuel ratio they need. If you don't have the booster exactly aligned in the bore, the booster is actually the device that will measure the airflow going through it that pulls a fuel out of the center hole through the booster. Now you so the can, air going through that center hole this creates hole, a low pressure, pressure that and pulls draws fuel. Yeah. Fuel, yeah. And then it all comes from the, the fuel bowl, mm -hmm. then the main jets and up the main well, and you can change the fuel hole size. So many tuning aspects of a booster. This one here, we got a little bit of a back cut put in the back side of that. Mm -hmm. This way it creates a harder signal sooner. Where if you look at these, these have a tremendous amount of signal because of that crossbar. Now this one is one that we've modified. So you can see the difference between those two. And these I had machined at my dad's engine shop in Van Nuys, California. Now if you look at the center of the booster where the crossbar is, there are some series that say that that bar has to stay intact. Well, we left it intact. But you near it a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. And the, the bottom of the stem has been CNC'd. And the sides have been CNC'd to where it's been narrowed. So it's not the same finish as you can see. Yeah. It's a lot different. Then you go to the NASCAR where they got the Camping World Series or the Xfinity Cup. We call it the Bush, where they allow you to do pretty much whatever you want. So it's narrowed down to 300 thousandths. We got a V shaped in the bottom of it to help pull air around it. Using CFD, you can study the airflow and the high pressure areas in the Venturi. This area has got a lot of, a lot of disturbance. So what happens is when the air crosses over, you create a lot of tumbling air, which really screws up air signal and airflow. This area over here is more of a high pressure area. The laminar airflow really wants to stick to the side of the wall and, and follow in it because the way the air comes in, it's actually being pulled in. It's not being forced in. Then you start forcing air in over the high speed, the idle air jet here, the high speed, you can create different pressure inside the metering block. And with the vent tubes, that's another thing. The, the height here will change what they call the bowl pressure. If you've got a tide level halfway up the sight glass and you've got 140 mile an hour air speed going across here, it's going to pressurize the bowl. So all of a sudden you have more weight pushing down the jets, which will actually richen the engine up. Restrictor plate racing, we'd run these all the way up to the top, run them flat, and have about three eighths of clearance between the, the top of the lid and the carburetor vent tube. So it desensitizes a booster in out of the carburetor in and out of the draft. Mm -hmm. You didn't all of a sudden be behind another car and it's loading up rich or part throttle and it's not running good. And then you get out in the draft and all of a sudden she wakes up. In the olden days, you'd throw things against the wall and see what sticks. Well, that was the thing that we were talking about earlier. The plate days, there was so much development on these carburetors because of that. When you had that retriever plate on there, the engine was so sensitive to every small change you could make. Right. So I remember this stuff being huge. Like I said, getting it exactly yeah. where it's supposed to be. What was the difference between the annular discharge uh, booster and the regular one? The ones? drop leg? Yeah. Um, the annular was really good in drafting. The thing is, when you use an annular discharge booster, mm -hmm. my boss told me it's just all about the vena contracta. 
course, I looked like, what are you, Phoenix Attracted? And, English. Yeah, exactly. It marks as that's the air column when it goes through the Venturi that it is its tightest point, like an hourglass. Mm -hmm. So when you could take that hourglass and you could shift it, move it, lengthen it, and whenever you got one CFM more air, mm -hmm. that would be about one horsepower. Whatever you can gain through that plate by changing that column. Mm -hmm. And how you change a column, did you do it with throttle blades? Did you do it with large screws? Mm -hmm. Anything to disrupt it or to change it yeah, would be a plus. Hmm. That's why I love carburetors. So it's like, it's part aerodynamics, part, you know, chemistry. Cause it's, you gotta get the fuel through there right. and, and you gotta get the fuel to begin to atomize so it can then vaporize. So you can't burn liquid fuel. So right. it's doing more than just delivering fuel. You have to begin to atomize that fuel. Right, a lot of people will tell me, well, the job of the main well is to atomize the fuel. I don't look at it that way. I look at the main well it's got, you can run a one degree taper, you can run a two degree taper, you can run a two and a half, three degree taper. Mm -hmm. And this changes a lot of things. All those emulsion bleeds act as timers on how they actually will allow you to pull fuel in. Okay. What's an emulsion bleed? Emulsion bleed, that's for a different, that's a, for different video oh. <laughs> we'll, that's, have to, that's, we'll have to pull that's 102 or 201 that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's high, high end yeah. stuff explain those two pieces yeah. over there are these the different pieces over these here. are the two here they're angular discharge and they basically have inserts and these inserts come in a 500 id a 550 and a 600 and you can put whatever holes design that you think would work these are all very symmetrical we have done it to where we do five on one side and do one way over here, then we would take and clock the insert to balance out the air fuel ratio from cylinder at cylinder bias. And here's the banjo that they sit in. They just get pressed in there and the fuel goes around and these go all the way down inside. And these are the drop legs that will make more horsepower than these, will flow more air. That is a stock booster. As you can see, there's no back cut in it. It's got a very small hole. And the problem is, is being this booster has no back cut like this, this one was a lot easier for it to pull fuel out at a lower RPM. Higher RPM, it doesn't matter. It's still drawing fuel out of it. But once you get to where... So would this be like where the difference comes between like a street car carburetor and a, exactly. a wide open race car exactly. carburetor? Yeah, this is a carburetor that's what booster is used for a 750 down leg and a 4412 Holley. So we found out that you put a back cut in those things. Now you, there's other things you can do with the calibration as far as getting more air into the engine. This will create a stronger signal. So at a lower RPM, it picks fuel up quicker out of the bowl. Hmm. Now how does that relate to the throttle response? It's tremendous. So, I mean, if you look at the two of these on the top, you may not be able to tell one's got a smaller and one much larger. I mean, we've actually got have these to where they're quite a bit bigger, 0.45. You can change that radius and you can change, change the Change the radius, you change the back cut, the ID diameter. Mm -hmm. There's just so many different avenues you can do. We wouldn't want to get too big on a large Venturi carburetor like this. So, I mean, this one has the back cut boosters in them mm -hmm. and the IDs opened up over a stock, stock booster. But we didn't go as far as we could because the fact that the size of this carburetor, the Venturi, is a 1.610. It's very big, yeah. yeah. And it's an inch and three quarter bottom. But if you can take your camera, it's going to flow a lot of air. It's got thin butterfly shafts in it. Yeah, it looks very uh, straight. There's no, right. there's not a lot of nonsense yeah, in there. Mean, well, explain that, because I think that's one of the big differences between, like, we call it purpose-built racing carburetor versus, we call it the out-of-the-box carburetor. Because Holly's not stupid, right? They didn't. No, no, they, they, they understand all of these things. Yeah. But some of these things are mass-produced pieces. Right. Versus the Ferrari that's everything's fit. Yeah. Holly's one purpose is is to make a component mm -hmm. that's affordable that people can bolt on their car and and go race it or run on the street. They've done a very good job of it. But it's assembly line work. I mean, we could take one of these new carbers apart, and I yeah I could pick it apart and say what's this isn't right this isn't right and this isn't right but i want i want to give somebody something that came out of my learning of what i think a carburetor should be done you know a street carburetor like let's say that was a street carburetor 
it's actually calibrated and, and different than a race carburetor. Race carburetor, you want throttle response and wide open throttle. Mm -hmm. You've got to have drivability at a little bit of par throttle yep. and wide open throttle. This thing, no wide open. It's all set up for drivability. Yeah. Par low throttle. Thro yeah, a lot of low throttle, throttle yeah. idle. Come, yeah, coming off idle, that's a big, yeah. di big difference there, yeah. So we can get into it later. I mean, the mixture screw settings for a street carburetor are different than you'd have for a race carburetor. So in reality, it's the tolerance stack here is what the biggest difference is. It's not yeah. it's not the the thinking of it and the components. No. It's so much more that it's the tolerance stack. It's like blueprinting an engine. Exactly. But you know, you know what is blueprinting an engine? It's basically going off what what the tolerances were for the manufacturer, Ford, yeah. Chevrolet, or Chrysler. That we know that when he put those boosters in, they want to be dead center. They don't want to be off left or right or back and front this way. So the closer we get them, the better we are. If you take a out of the box 750, whatever a really common size of a Holley double pumper or mechanical secondary is, and you have your 750, what is left on yours that is stock? Like what kind of proprietary or your own unique design goes into one of these things? Because I see, I mean, this is not that, I mean, that's got your name on it. I don't think Holly made that. No. <laughs> These. None of this actually is Holly. These are aftermarket throttle shafts. Throttle blades are aftermarket. The fuel bowls are aftermarket. They're made by Dave Braswell. Now, this is like the brains, right? Of the carburetor. It's a, it's a big part of it, yeah. It's a big part of it. So explain what's in a metering block in the 101. How does a metering block work? Well, we got them right here. Hey, you got, you got them. Hey, just happen to have some fresh from them. Huh. <laughs> Here's a brand new metering plate. And it's real simple. I mean, this is the, we can, so this is a tied area where all the fuel is maintained and it will stay at a certain level mm -hmm. via the float. And here's your fuel reservoir back here on this side. Right. Here are the main jets. Those are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And you can change them whenever you want. Whenever you think your horsepower needs it or the air's, air's gotten better. Mm -hmm. One thing about that with a carburetor, when the air does get better, these boosters know it. And they will sense the air density yeah, and, and change the calibration. It's very simple, you know, and the fact that it's got a job of basically calibrating the fuel. One way to think about before we go too far, when we do one of these carburetors, we want the, the fuel curve to follow the torque curve. Right. So when the fuel follows the torque curve, the, the horsepower curve comes up too. Yeah. Because basically, I mean, you look at peak torque, and that is what they call uh, volumetric efficiency. Yep. It's where the engine is balance as far as yep. bore and stroke, rod to stroke ratio, valve vent timing, compression everything's rate, everything's happy. It's, yep. make, it's wonderful. So the better you can make that fuel curve at peak torque, follow it, the, the, the better off you are. So, so I, I get the jets on the backside here. Right. right. And they're feeding in to these holes. No, where, no. where, where, where does yeah, the jet feed? What's going on in here? I'm like, okay. follow the, the fuel. The main jet, fuel goes in here. This is the main side. So this is on actually, how do you want to call that, Blake? Do you call it the reservoir side? You yeah, want yeah. The bowl side. I call it the yep. fuel bowl side. Yep. And what it does is pretty much is everything runs off the main jet. Now that's, everything has to go meter through the main well. And as this thing is sitting there idling, there is going to be fuel being pulled through this main well. And these, all these passages are adjustable. Right now there's nothing in them, but as you work to the top, and work your way down, these passages get a lot weaker. So this is a very sensitive patch, passage up here, and this is where we tune the bottom end of the engine. As we get more towards the, the top end numbers, we start feeding in here because the air speed's up higher and it's pulling more fuel out. So the fuel's going in at the bottom and it's going up this well and then entering back to this passage. This is all air, this side. There's no, no, this no side. fuel on this side at all. This is an air passage. Okay. So that's, hmm. is that's okay. connected to where okay yeah i'm, I'm don't don't get lost because we haven't gotten to where you you're asking yet <laughs> so that's all controlled by the high speed okay and the thing is everybody says the high speed man that that leans out the top end not true what the high speed does is it controls how much throttle blade opening you have before it starts pulling booster fuel out the boosters now if you start putting more high speed in, they say, well, it takes fuel away from the top end. It does because it's allowing this pass, pass, package right here to work better. Okay, so I think I'm putting this together now. This is air right here. And does yeah. this, this leads into Here's the fuel these. side. Correct, this does. So this is coming in through like that. Yeah, it comes in through here. So when that hole here is lined up with here, 
right here. Mm -hmm. That's what, these are, these are just air timers. That's all that is. Okay. You know, that is where the fuel comes out of the main well. And if you had no holes here, that fuel would just flow right up through there. You'd have, it'd be just too rich, it wouldn't even run. Hmm. So this is why you put these holes in here, because they will actually slow the air signal, the fuel signal down. When the engine's just getting off throttle, how soon do you want fuel coming out the boosters? Well, if let's say you got a two barrel, and it's got a big hole with a stock booster like this, well, you're gonna need fuel right away, but it's got a big hole and a big signal. So you wouldn't get very aggressive here on the top holes. But now if we were to take and put this booster in with a back cut and a bigger cross dimensional pull here, well, you know, you can get a little bit more aggressive here because it's gonna have a stronger signal to pull fuel out the stem. So this this air channel here is coming through these, or one of these? That's or? where the air is coming from. That's the only place that air will actually enter from here. So this is just... There's no vacuum coming through here. This is just airflow flowing over this that's kind of it's, manipulating it's, what's going on in it's there. It's all vacuum. So where's the air? Is there something air coming out of the yes, bottom of here? Yeah, why you ask? It's vacuum and it's coming from the engine. Okay, yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to clear up. This is going up and down, the valves and open and stuff like that is pulling constantly. Yeah, so um, where's the air coming in and going out? It's coming in here, right? Yeah. So when this is, well, do you have a body that's not bolted something so we can see like what the backside of this looks like without giving any way, any secrets? <laughs> fuel injection tells the carburetor, or tells the engine how much fuel you're gonna give it. Yeah, and it tells everything. And, the, well, I'm sorry, you're doing a deal. You're good, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> He's about to go off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so I, Hartford would say, you know, fuel injection tells the engine how much fuel it's gonna get, whereas, with a carburetor, it's listening to what the engine's asking for and then giving it. Well, how does it know what it's asking for? It's all about the signal. So when that intake valve is open and the piston is moving down and it's creating that manifold vacuum, that manifold vacuum is, up, is reaching up to here and it's pulling that air past this. When the air comes past this, it's gonna create that signal, like Bill said, back to the metering block, back to the, to the float bowl to pull that fuel in. So it's listening to what's going on, which is why all these different devices are so important because there's like different listening apparatuses and then the fuel delivery that goes with it. Whether it's a plate engine that's running in a really narrow RPM range or a drag car that's running, you know, uh, I guess a big difference would be a stick shift car versus an automatic, right? right. There's not as many shift points. So the how broad that RPM band is makes a huge difference in all these things. Right. That is very interesting. I'd say that's a pretty good explanation of what we're looking for, because I don't think the average guy really understands what's going on. Like you get the people that are like, oh, it's just like a toilet bowl dumping fuel into the engine. It's like yeah, not. So much more. <laughs> you know, we could spend hours on this just on meter and blocks and base plates and, and breaking up the different circuitry of the carburetor from the idle circuit transition on um, the intermediate circuit, the main jet, how it all works and correlates together. This this is the nitty gritty that we're trying to figure out here because I don't know how this happens. I know fuel goes in, engine burns it, it's either happy or it's not. Right. But following the pathway of where does okay. fuel enter, exit, air, how does it correlate? Right. Where's the interaction? Now just FYI, a lot of this I don't want to educate too many people on. Like, uh, you know what I mean? Am I asking questions you don't want to answer? <laughs> You're doing a good job, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead and shut that off. <laughs> this is all super fascinating because I remember being 18, messing around with a carburetor. Like, you know, you do the idle and then you sit there and you okay. jab the gas. And if it stutters, then you change this thingy and all that. <laughs> and power valves. Like, I never really understood what these are doing. So We could talk, we could talk about that. It's probably better than the meter block. So it's atomized when it gets here it's not atomizing once it enters the airstream now you know what under high speed photography that is a fire hose you can see it's not mixed with air huh it comes out of there like it, i mean it's it, aerated but it's not yeah atomized. It, it's not like what you would think aeration is at everhams we used lasers to measure droplet size to find out if we wanted large droplets or small droplets how much surface area do we want in more drops or in less drops in the antler discharge carburetor? It was fun to ride their coattails on how they approached it and, mm -hmm. and do this. 
um, even CFD, you know, stuttering the oh, air yeah. pressure differentials around the throttle blades. Uh, the Dodge guys were amazing. I remember they did yeah. some stuff. They did a CFD study one time on the on the way the air moved down the windshield through the cowl right. on, a, on a Speedway deal. I think it took them like 72 hours back then for the pro program to run to do the simulation. And they came back and said, okay, here's how the air actually moves down the windshield through the air box. So you redesigned your air box. And of right. course, you know, his engine was on the pole of the 500 and we were on the outside pole of the 500 <laughs> using all that kind of fun stuff. So it was, it was cool to be able to use Dodge's money back then to <laughs> learn some stuff. Now here's something interesting is that we all think that this is where all the fuel comes from. But with this meter block, the way it's designed, it's got a power valve. And the way the power valve opens is there's, this is the vacuum side. So when the butterflies are closed, this power valve gets sucked closed. So no fuel can actually flow through it, through the, the orifices where it goes. When it opens, there's a seat there. The fuel goes in there, feeds, comes out these windows to these two little orifices right there. Mm. This is the enrichment circuit. And it works in a way to where when the load demand comes up with horsepower, this valve opens and gives it more fuel. And that's straight out of the fuel bowl. It's un really the only way it's metered is the size of the orifice on the power valve channel. And these power valves come in any size from two and a half. I've got them all up to 10 and a half. And it's something you can actually introduce more fuel when it needs it by having a bigger number because all it is is a differential of vacuum when it begins to the manifold, open. right. So on idle, you know, most race engines have anywhere from 11 to 12 inches of vacuum. You get in your crate engines are about 22 inches of vacuum. The smaller the power valve, you got to get more throttle blade opening for the vacuum to drop in the plenum chamber to open the power valve. It's all really simple and it's something that drivers can feel on the track or you can change something on the, on the engine dyno to get a you know, a, a, a spike out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you might get a, a dip in the torque curve. That could be your, your answer. Either bigger here or bigger in this restriction here. And then we go bigger here on the restriction, you can go smaller on the main jet. Or vice versa, you can go bigger on the main jet and smaller here. Because that dip in the torque curve is probably mean you're not giving it enough, enough fuel. fuel. Exactly. And the carburetor will only take what it needs. You know, you just got to get the curve right. Because each cylinder is different. You got a, oh God, you yeah. got this thing sitting in the middle of the car engine. You got individual length runners, right? Yep. You got short ones here. You got long ones here. Then you got the firing order. Mm -hmm. Then you got the pulses that are pulling from one another. You got overlap, yeah, and it's going uh, back and yeah. forth and everything. Yeah. So I mean, so this is kind of similar to how a diesel runs with no throttle body, where it's only, but it's kind of pulling the air based on the fuel that the engine is taking. Instead of I'm gonna play the fifth. I've never worked on a diesel. I'm me neither. I'm I'm a diesel idiot. So yeah. Well, I I was always under the impression that's why diesels got good uh, fuel mileage is because they were only taking the air that they needed instead of having a a flap control it. Yeah, throttle blades all about controlling engine speed. Yeah, as the diesels control their engine speed with the fuel. Yep. But you I, people don't run gas engines with fuel delivery and just have a no. I got, all I can tell you is right now you're, that conversation I don't know <laughs> I don't know how how a diesel engine actually how their fuel injection works I've yeah. never worked on one well maybe we'll have to find a, a, a diesel guy and yeah. get some <laughs> get some yeah, diesel yeah. tech I understand how that works that's yeah. a world that intrigues me anyway we'll no. go back to this <laughs> yeah. yeah it's not this <laughs> yeah yeah so I mean you know like on base plates this is what comes stock from a holly you know where uh, they got this is a non HP base plate, let's make it clear. But, you know, this is a HP one, but, you know, we'll machine the throttle shafts so the pad thickness and the throttle blades tolerances is legal. We will cut the base plates, deburr the base plates. Explain what the little hole is down there in the bottom. That is the idle circuit. That is the one hole that's in each bore mm -hmm. that you will adjust to make the engine idle. Now, there's two different ways of doing the transfer slot. If you look in this back hole here, there's a, a tiny little hole. Can yeah. You see it? yeah, it almost looks like a, like it's not even a hole, like a little speck. No, we filled it in with DEFCON, and that hole was put in there back in the 60s when Grandma had her 440 Cornet pulling into the gas station to get it full of fuel. She'd tell the attendant, thing runs terrible. Well, the reason why is that the rear bowls, she never got into them. The engine would be running on stale fuel. 
Got uh, it. So they put that hole in there so it would constantly drain the back bowls to keep fresh fuel in there. So, you know, being we're using the race tank, we've got these DEVCON closed and we don't have any transfer slots showing. We want these open just enough so they don't stick in the bore because the secondary and the primary work at a different rate of opening because of the length of the center point from where the arm is here and here. I like them to run one to one. Okay. Some series say that you can't do that. NASCAR is one. Mm -hmm. You got to run the stock location, you know. But the thing is, you and I both know back in the days of the Bush Garage, mm -hmm. we'd have we'd buy thirty carburetors. Oh God! We'd run them all to find which of the best one was. Mm -hmm. Find that best one, then start swapping meter blocks and and base plates. Then all of a sudden you're up more horsepower. Yep. It's something that you don't have to cheat it. You just got to make them all the same and make them right. And this way, everybody's got the same thing. Optimizing, yeah. But they don't want to go down that, that direction. Hmm. Something that I just kind of realized here is that I can see the direct line of how NASCAR Motorsports in general became so money driven. Because back in the old days, you didn't have a PhD in one piece of the engine. There was nobody who had that much knowledge. But as time goes on, you develop these guys who are experts and wizards about this one little thing. And then to be competitive, you got to have every single one of those guys on your payroll or you're not going to win. It's crazy. When I moved back here, Robert Yates hired me from Honda, the IndyCar program. And I remember sitting down with Robert and he said, what do you see the NASCAR going in the future? And I said, how many engineers do you have? So we got one, Dave Kreska. And I said, well, it's going to turn to a point where you won't have crew chiefs. You won't have head of departments. So They'll all be engineers, be engineer driven. I said, when it becomes that, this series will be out of control. And a few of the people at, at Robert Yates told me, there's no way that's going to happen. Look at it today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. I mean, the yeah. space shuttle didn't fly, or the Apollo mission didn't fly on hot rod technology, throw it against the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> Right? Yeah. They had engineers. They used slide rules back in the day. But very, very talented, smart people. If you like this video and you like what we do and you'd like to support it, be a part of it, you can go to stapletonautoworks.com and find the shirts, hats, and stickers that we have right behind us here, which Logan's going to show you. I'm wearing this awesome Goodwrench inspired hoodie. Oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And we have this Trophy Hunter shirt. That is the shirt that I'm wearing right now. It's, we have that in shirt and hoodie format. So you can be cold or warm and be covered either way. It looks like a contingency decal from the 90s, which we also have decal form. They are, they come in a five pack, they're $9. You get all five of these and you can stick them on whatever you want. They won't fall off. They're good stickers. Toolbox approved.